Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. It's such a pleasure for me to be here with you all. Um, thank you for having me. It's a great delight to be here. And I'd like to thank particularly the RCNC board uh, for their kind invitation for me to come and speak. Um, and I'd like to particularly thank Nancy Corbin for her generosity in hosting me and picking me up, bringing me here. Um, thank you so much. I felt very warmly welcomed. Uh, thank you. Um, but yeah, it's such a delight to be here. I'm currently in California uh, because I'm the W. Benson Hera Egyptology Scholar in Residence at California State University, San Bernardino. Um, and in that role, I'm teaching an upper division course that I've designed on ancient Egyptian funerary art and museum collections. And I have the wonderful opportunity of being able to use the Egyptology collection there on campus, which is part of the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art. Um, so I'm doing a lot of teaching with the collection and really, really excited about that. I've had a few weeks of class already and have a really engaged group of students and I'm really loving being able to be here um, and be amongst that community. Uh, today I am going to be speaking to you about some of the results from my PhD research, uh, which I completed at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I did this work in the Department of History and Archaeology, so I'd just like to acknowledge the staff there and, and thank them for their support. Um, and in particular, my principal supervisor, Professor Nagib Kanawadi, who has been a great source of support for me in my research and in my career. Uh, now, in my PhD, I, most, I focused on funerary art and in particular two of the main types of art that we have from elite tombs from the late Old Kingdom to the end of the Middle Kingdom. And these are wall scenes and funerary models. Uh, now, we know artistic representations in the tomb were not simply decoration. They had a specific practical function and they served as an important safeguard for the deceased's well-being and sustenance in the afterlife. Now, wall scenes have been quite extensively studied in scholarship. There's been a lot of work that's been done on the themes represented, artistic techniques, uh, the significance, the purpose of scenes in the tomb, but funerary models have not nearly received the same level of attention. And because of that, there are still significant gaps in our understanding of the medium. And so I wanted to investigate this really common type of artwork further and gain a better understanding into the purpose and the significance of this type of artwork in elite tombs. So to begin with, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of, the same, of these two types of artworks. So everyone is on the same page as we get going. So to begin with, wall scenes. Wall scenes comprise two-dimensional representations that were painted and or carved in relief on the walls of the tomb. This form of funerary artwork became established in the Third Dynasty and continued in a prevalent way throughout the Pharaonic period. During the Old and Middle Kingdom periods, which is the time periods that I focus on, these scenes are known as everyday life scenes. We have minor figures engaged in arrested movement as they conduct a wide range of activities that would have regularly occurred on Earth including agriculture, food production, industrial processes, marshland activities, bearers presenting offerings, among many others. And I have a small selection here uh, to give you a bit of an example of, of the types of themes we have commonly represented. It's likely that these scenes had some symbolic function that aimed to ensure the deceased's eternal rebirth in the afterlife, as well as serving as a form of provision for the deceased's eternal nourishment. The wall scenes were typically positioned in the above ground part of the tomb, which was the chapel. And this remained accessible to the living after the tomb owner's death, enabling wall scenes to be seen by all visitors to the tomb. Funerary models, they comprise a small three-dimensional sculptures that depict people and animals engaged in activities of everyday life. So you can see that many of the same themes of the themes represented by models are also found in wall scenes. And I've got a selection here, which you can see are very similar to the ones of wall scenes. So we have agriculture, food preparation, industrial processes, riverine transport and bearers presenting offerings. The earliest examples we have are from the fourth and fifth dynasties. And these consist of single figures fashioned of limestone who are most commonly engaged in tasks related to food preparation. It's in the late sixth dynasty when that the typical funerary model appeared. At this time, the figures began to be fashioned of wood and they were arranged as groups on a single baseboard. 
The production of models reached its peak during the early Middle Kingdom, which is when we have the greatest quantity of examples, the greatest distribution across Egypt, and also the greatest range of themes represented for the medium. But manufacture rapidly declined in the late Middle Kingdom, and by the New Kingdom, funerary models had entirely disappeared from elite funerary assemblages. So this is a much more restricted time period of usage than we have for wall scenes. The most common location of funerary models in the tomb during the late Old Kingdom to the end of the Middle Kingdom was the burial chamber. In this location, they weren't seen by the living and instead they were solely accessible to the deceased. Now, because of these similarities in themes represented between wall scenes and funerary models, scholars have regularly labeled funerary models as duplicates or substitutes of wall scenes. So just to pull on a few examples here from some of our leading scholars in um, ancient Egyptian art, we have Taylor who notes that wall scenes were augmented by models. Schaefer writes that the content of wall scenes was transformed into three-dimensional form. Tiradridi states that models were a three-dimensional transposition of wall scenes. And Malik goes further by labeling models three-dimensional equivalents of tomb scenes. And Tuli, who was one of our leading scholars on funerary models, asserts that they were designed to replace or supplement painted scenes. Now, the problem with this, these statements is not only do they overemphasize the similarities between the two media, they also create the assumption that funerary models serve the exact same purpose in the tomb as wall scenes. But only a comparative analysis of the two media can determine if that is actually correct, and that work has not yet been conducted. So this is what I chose to undertake in my PhD research. I wanted to determine what the precise relationship is between funerary models and wall scenes, and in doing that, to get a better understanding of the purpose and the significance of funerary models in the tomb. Now, in order to conduct an effective and detailed comparison, I needed to put parameters on what is a very large corpus of material, and I primarily achieved this through restricting the sites that I looked at. I concentrated my project on the region of Middle Egypt, specifically the cemeteries of Mer, Deir el Bersha, and Beni Hassan. Each of these cemeteries contains the tombs of the ruling elite of their province from the late Old Kingdom to the end of the Middle Kingdom. And this is the peak period of model production. The cemeteries also contain the burials of the family members of the governors and the lower administrative elite. Middle Egypt experienced significant economic development during the late, and, late Old and Middle Kingdoms, and the nomarchal tombs exhibit supreme wealth in their construction and decoration, and this is particularly evident in their wall scenes. Middle Egypt also specialised in woodcraft during the early Middle Kingdom, which encouraged the production of numerous wooden items, including funerary models. Because of this, a rich body of both wall scenes and funerary models is preserved from the three sites, allowing for a large corpus of sources to be collected and analysed. The three cemeteries are also quite well documented, allowing for a relatively comprehensive corpus of sources to be obtained. So once I had selected these three sites for my analysis, I collected all of the known wall scenes and funerary models from the cemeteries, and I did this through an extensive examination of excavation reports and museum catalogues, and also visited a number of museums and the cemeteries themselves. Once the corpus was collected, I categorised the representations according to the themes represented and then began the comparison looking at one theme at a time. The comparison itself required a very detailed examination of every representation. When looking at each model and each wall scene, I recorded all of the major aspects of the representation and also all of the minor details. So these included the specific movements and gestures of the figures, the objects and equipment that they used, the spatial relationships between the components, the appearance of animals and how they're depicted, the architectural structures represented, the depiction of the surrounding environment, the use of inscriptions in the representations, the colours employed and the artistic quality of the designs, the use of size and scale, 
the materials used and the construction methods employed in artistic creation, and also the location of the representations in the tomb. I also made careful note of the themes and motifs that are present in one medium, but absent in the other. So studying these representations in this close level of detail enabled me to identify a number of key differences between wall scenes and funerary models that hadn't previously been observed in scholarship. Today, I'm gonna to show you the results of this comparison by looking at just three themes. These are bread making, offering bearers and cattle in procession. I'm going to highlight some of the main differences that I identified for each theme and reveal what these differences mean for our understanding of funerary models. So looking at our first theme for today, which is bread making. Bread was one of the staples of the ancient Egyptian diet, providing an essential form of nourishment. It supplied daily sustenance for the whole population and held a vital role in the economy. It also had an important role in death, forming one of the main items of the offering list and being deposited in the tomb as a funerary offering. So it's therefore not surprising that the production of bread holds an important place in the repertoires of both wall scenes and funerary models. In my study, I identified and examined a total of 31 models and eight wall scenes of bread making, demonstrating that it's a particularly popular theme for funerary models. <clears throat> Although no single artwork displays all of the stages involved in making bread, several of the most important steps are depicted by both media. What's notable is that bread making is the most expansive theme in the repertoire of funerary models in terms of the quantity of stages represented. Most themes in models are particularly condensed with often a single activity representative of an entire process. So to give you an example of this, what we have here is the representation of leather work. In funerary models, it's represented by a single figure cutting the soles of sandals, which is the characteristic task of the process. Whereas wall scenes portray multiple manufacturing tasks, beginning with the treatment of the hides and ending with the finished leather products. But the theme of bread making in models incorporates almost the full range of tasks that we have in wall scenes. So this is a significant difference from the other themes that we find represented. You can see in this list here that the different bread making, the range of different bread making activities represented. And you can see that almost all are portrayed by both media. Within one assemblage of funerary models, it's common to find more than one of these tasks represented. This was either achieved through a collection of separate statuettes or as a combined group model. So these examples here are all from the tomb of Neunk Pepikem at Mer, which is from the late sixth dynasty. And these are the ones that all represent tasks related to bread making. So we have figures grinding grain on a quernstone. We have figures kneading dough, shaping dough into loaves and some baking bread in the oven. So these are the separate statuettes. Alternatively, it could be a group model, which you can see an example of here from the tomb of Kedi at Beni Hassan, dating to the Middle Kingdom. In this representation, we have in the forefront a man pounding grain with mortar and pestle. Behind him are two women grinding grain on quern stones. Um, in front of them on the left is a female figure sieving grain. And then also in the front is a, a woman baking bread at an oven. The popularity of bread making in funerary models isn't only witnessed in the quantity of sculptures and the range of tasks depicted, but also in its prolonged appearance in the repertoire. The earliest models that we have, the individual limestone serving statuettes of the 4th and 5th dynasties, they are mainly concerned with food preparation. Most are engaged in bread making tasks, with the most common motif of these early statuettes being a female miller grinding grain on a quernstone, an example of which you can see here on the left. In the late 6th dynasty, when the sculptures began to be fully constructed of wood, several baking tasks were added to the repertoire. 
Bread making remains dominant during the period of peak model production in the early Middle Kingdom. And even when model manufacture rapidly declined towards the end of the Middle Kingdom, there are still a few limestone sculptures of bread making known. So it's clear that the bread making theme holds an important and dominant place in the repertoire of funerary models. My comparison of the bread making theme also revealed some differences between the two media that can be attributed to their contrasting technical properties. So I'll provide you with just a few examples of this by looking at the motif of grinding grain on a quernstone. Both wall scenes and funerary models regularly portray two millers engaged in this task, although there are some differences in their arrangement. In wall scenes, the millers are consistently positioned opposite each other with the ends of their querns sometimes making contact. And you can see this here in the line drawing of the scene from the west wall of the tomb of Amenemhat at Beni Hassan. As artists worked with a two-dimensional perspective, it's probable that this arrangement was a means for them to convey a side-by-side -side positioning without any figure or component being hidden from view. Alternatively, models could depict the millers in their actual side-by-side -side positioning as they operated in a three-dimensional perspective. In this model here from the tomb of Henu at Deir el Bersha, the three millers are evenly spaced across the baseboard without any one being obscured from view. This holistic perspective also enables the positioning of the miller's hands on top of the grinding stone to be clearly conveyed, as the models could offer a top-down view as well as a side view. In the model of Henu, the miller's hands are placed evenly side by side on top of the stone, whereas in the wall scene of Amenemhat, the artist has placed one of the miller's hands in front of the other so that both can be seen. These minute differences result from the contrasting technical properties of wall scenes and funerary models and reveal that each design had to be specifically created according to the capabilities of that medium. The production of bread certainly holds a prime position among both wall scenes and funerary models, forming a vital source of nourishment for the tomb owner. Among the repertoire of funerary models though, bread making should be considered an essential theme. Models of bread making present a particularly expansive portrayal and remain prominent throughout the period of model usage. It's likely that this significance of bread making in the model repertoire should be attributed to the location of sculptures in the burial chamber. Here, they were positioned in close proximity to the deceased and so could provide him with a perpetual source of nourishment in the afterlife. So turning to our second theme for today, which is offering bearers. The representation of figures presenting offerings was particularly important as it provided the deceased with the necessary nourishment and supplies they needed for the afterlife. In life, wealthy tomb owners established a mortuary cult that would ideally provide a perpetual supply of desired offerings, but the maintenance of this cult couldn't be ensured. So representations of, present, of figures presenting offerings formed a vital safeguard in the eternal provisioning of the deceased. In both wall scenes and funerary models, there are two main aspects of this theme, the bearers themselves and the offerings they present. There are numerous examples of offering bearers in both media, but there is a significant difference in quantity. The presentation of offerings is a standard element of wall scenes, perhaps forming the most important theme in the tomb chapel. Almost all decorated tombs include a variation of this theme and many feature multiple scenes of offering bearers. In my study, I identified examples of offering bearers on over 60 different walls of 22 tombs, totaling 63 wall scenes. While still popular in models, there are less examples of offering bearers with only 31 identified in my study. Wall scenes also regularly devote a large amount of space to the theme. 
You can see this here in the largest example of an offering bearer wall seam that I examined in my study, which includes 42 bearers spread across three registers. Such extensive display highlights the immense value of offering bearers in the repertoire of wall scenes. With more space dedicated to the theme, a greater number of bearers could be illustrated. Models, on the other hand, were typically more condensed in their representation of this theme, with often only a single bearer represented. This is the most common way of depicting the theme, with 22 of the 31 examples I examined comprising a single bearer. But models could also depict offering bearers in pairs with three examples identified in my study, or as processions of three or more bearers, of which I found six examples. So this is quite different from wall scenes, where offering bearers are almost exclusively portrayed in long lines of procession. When considering the offerings that the bearers carry, there are a number of similarities between the two media, with all goods transported in models also carried by bearers in wall scenes. However, wall scenes illustrate a much wider variety of goods. This table here highlights some of the different offerings that I found among the representations, showing the more expansive range found in wall scenes. Again, with more space dedicated to the theme, a greater variety of offerings could be portrayed. Of the goods transported by model offering bearers, by far the most common is a type of container, most frequently a basket, but also boxes, chests, and a type of backpack. The basket is especially common for female offering bearers. These figures are characteristically represented supporting it on their head with a raised hand, while their other hand hangs by their side, either empty or grasping an additional item, most often a bird. In these bearers you can see here from the tomb of Jehutinacht at Deir el Bersha, each woman balances a basket on her head with the fingers of her left hand closing over the top, and her right hand hanging empty by her side. Such baskets very rarely have their contents specified. While the three-dimensional medium had the ability to depict hollow containers with the contents actually stored within, it's interesting to note that the majority of loads, like the ones you can see here, are crafted as solid pieces. This suggests that it was a deliberate design choice. By depicting closed containers, I believe that the loads could be symbolic of all types of offerings desired by the deceased. This was probably of particular importance for models, which were quite condensed in their representation, allowing for a single model offering bearer to encapsulate all of the desired provisions. In contrast, the contents of baskets and other containers in wall scenes are regularly specified they often emerge from the top of the basket while being partially obscured by the side due to the two-dimensional perspective. You can see an example of this in the scene on the top right from the tomb of Pepiunk the Black at Mea. For the contents to be depicted in full view in the two-dimensional perspective, they were required to be lined across the top of the basket, which you can see an example of in the scene of Amenem Hat displayed along the bottom. <coughs> Alternatively, artists could use accompanying captions to identify the products stored within. In the scene from the tomb of Bucket 3 in the top left, this is done to identify the products obtained from the grape harvest, the bakehouse and the brew house. It was presumably more important for the contents of containers to be specified in wall scenes as they were displayed in the location of the mortuary cult. The tomb owner may have used the illustrations to encourage the maintenance of his cult by the living, to proclaim his superior access to a wide range of offerings, and to specify the goods he most desired. <laughs> Another difference in the offerings transported by bearers in wall scenes and funerary models is their portrayal of ritual elements. Wall scenes emphasize ritual through depicting bearers presenting a wide spectrum of ritual items and figures engaged in ceremonial activities. You can see an example of this here from the tomb of Nyang Pepikemet Mare, where five men performing the purification ceremony appear in the first register. 
the leading man in the second register burns incense, and below is a line of offering bearers presenting forelegs and fowl, which were impo important cult offerings. All of the figures are oriented towards the tomb owner seated at the offering table. The processes of pouring libations and burning incense were integral to the rituals that were carried out in the cult area. So displaying them in wall scenes was essential as the representations were portrayed in the cult space and were viewed by the living who would hopefully carry out these rituals. In contrast, ritual items are rarely transported by model offering bearers. I identified only three models which include Hess vases and or sensors among the goods transported. And unlike wall scenes, the model bearers don't conduct rituals with them, they simply transport them. This difference in emphasis should be attributed to the location of models in the substructure. Ritual activity was not conducted in the burial chamber, which was sealed after interment. And so ritual items weren't an essential part of the repertoire of funerary models. This difference in ritual emphasis is further seen in the motif of the presentation of fowl. While both models and wall scenes portray offering bearers carrying fowl, wall scenes include the additional motif of bearers wringing the necks of birds. This task holds a prime position in wall scenes. It occurs very commonly. The bearer undertaking the task is often positioned at the head of the procession and it's sometimes the eldest son of the tomb owner who is specified. You can see an example of this here in the scene from the tomb of Pepiunk the Black at Mare, where seven of the 12 bearers are engaged in this task. Fowl forms one of the principal offerings of the mortuary cult, and the wringing of the neck comprised a key element in the associated rituals. The depiction of this motif in the public tomb chapel was important, as this was where the living presented their offerings and performed the appropriate ceremonies. In the burial chamber, the importance of fowl was principally as a form of nourishment, and so representing the ritual action of wringing the neck wouldn't have been considered essential in models. Instead, model offering bearers simply carry fowl, usually in the hanging right hand, as you can see here in the model of Ipi from Beni Hassan. As the models were concealed from view, they didn't participate in the cult and its ritual activities celebrated by the living. While the offering bearer theme holds an important place in the repertoire of both wall scenes and funerary models, there is a clear difference in prominence and emphasis. Wall scenes dedicated more space to the theme and so illustrated a greater number of bearers and range of offerings. They also exhibit a ritual emphasis, which was essential for their location in the public cult chapel. Models, on the other hand, were typically more condensed, with a single figure often encompassing the entire theme. The offerings transported are often unspecified, so they could be symbolic of all desired goods. But when designated, they focus on essential foodstuffs rather than ritual items. In this way, they were better equipped to nourish the tomb owner in the afterlife. So turning to our third theme, which is cattle in procession. Cattle forms a vital part of ancient Egyptian society due to the, and economy due to the esteemed value of their products and services. They were the most highly valued domestic animal. Only the highest elite could afford a herd of cattle, and so representations of cattle and procession convey the superior status and wealth of tomb owners. In my study, I identified scenes of cattle and procession on over 35 different walls of 21 tombs, totaling 40 wall scenes. This high number is perhaps not surprising considering the fact that the scenes were displayed in the public chapel, allowing this proclamation of the tomb owner's status and wealth to be admired by visitors. But the same situation isn't found for funerary models, with only five examples of Catalan procession identified in my study. <clears throat> 
This difference in prominence is also seen in the sizes of the herds represented. Wall scenes illustrate grand herds, with some featuring exceptional numbers of cattle. One particularly large example is seen here from the tomb of Jehutihotep at Deir el Bersha, where three groups of calves are displayed in the upper register, a procession of five oxen in the middle register, and a very large herd of over 60 cattle in the lowest register. Grand herd sizes were especially important in wall scenes, as they visually expressed the tomb owner's superior status to any visitors to the tomb. In contrast, funerary models don't display grand herd sizes. Each model procession that I examined comprises only one or two oxen. Such a vastly restricted number of cattle should most likely be attributed to the location of models in the burial chamber. Here, the models were concealed from view and couldn't contribute to the public proclamation of the tomb owner's wealth and status, and so large herds were unnecessary. Instead, models were only accessible to the deceased, and so one or two oxen may have been considered sufficient to provide the cattle's desired products and services. There are also differences between wall scenes and funerary models in how they arrange the herds of cattle, and this again can be attributed to their contrasting technical properties. Working in three dimensions, models could position the animals in any location on the baseboard without any component being hidden from view. In this model here from Deir el Bersha, the two cattle stand side by side and both remain fully visible. Wall scenes, on the other hand, were restricted to a two-dimensional perspective that prevented this same realistic arrangement. The animals are depicted in profile, and if they were to be positioned side by side, like in models, then only the one nearest to the viewer would be seen. Artists use different methods to overcome this absence of depth, with one of the most common being lateral layering, which involves closely overlapping the body of one animal with, the, with that of the next. And you can see an example of this here from the scene in the tomb of Keti at Beni Hassan. This arrangement clearly conveys that the herd advances beside one another rather than in single file. In order to distinguish each animal in this lateral layering technique, the decoration of the hide is alternated. In this scene, the colors and patterns of the hides swap between light and dark shades and spotted and plain decoration. There are a number of differences in the representation of cattle in procession between funerary models and wall scenes, which can be attributed to their contrasting technical capabilities, as well as their different locations in the tomb. The theme was of particular importance in wall scenes, as these representations were displayed in the public part of the tomb, and so could proclaim the wealth and status of the tomb owner to any visitors. Elements of grandeur, like large herds of cattle in procession, were appropriate for these designs. Models, on the other hand, were concealed in the burial chamber, causing them to solely serve the deceased and not interact with the living. Representations of cattle in procession weren't as important as in this location, so the theme should be understood as supplementary in the repertoire of funerary models, being only included among more expansive model assemblages. So in looking at just these three themes today, we can see that there are differences in the level of importance of each theme to funerary models and wall scenes, as well as how each theme and motif were represented by the two media. Some themes like bread making are essential for funerary models as they offered necessary nourishment for the deceased's afterlife. Others like offering bearers were also important for models, but they presented a different emphasis to wall scenes, which was more appropriate for their location in the burial chamber. And some like cattle and procession don't hold the same prominence as they do in wall scenes and should be considered supplementary. When considering these three themes among the full corpus I examined in my study, we can see that certain themes predominate among models. In particular, granaries, bread making, brewing beer, boats, and offering bearers are the most commonly attested. 
Each of these themes contains a high number of examples among the corpus, showing their importance to the repertoire. Now, what's common about them is that they all offer products and services that would be of great benefit to the deceased's well-being in the afterlife. Granaries offer a supply of grain for nourishment. Bread making and brewing beer offer the staples of the diet. Boats provide river and transport and offering bearers transport the desired goods. These themes are all about provision. With their location in the burial chamber, funerary models were solely accessible to the deceased. This close association with the body presents a direct connection between the services offered by models and the tomb owner's afterlife. The emphasis on providing essential commodities and services witnessed in the repertoire of funerary models reveals the medium's primary role in the tomb, which was to provision the deceased for eternity. This is in contrast to wall scenes where, apart from offering bearers, these themes are not as commonly attested. While wall scenes also contributed to the deceased's sustenance in the afterlife, with their location in the tomb chapel, they had the additional function of publicly proclaiming the superior status, wealth and achievements of the tomb owner to any visitors to the tomb. This interaction with the living was an essential function of the chapel, causing the repertoire of wall scenes to be specifically designed and selected to impress visitors and presumably to encourage them to present offerings. This is further witnessed in some of the themes that can be considered essential in the repertoire of wall scenes, but are entirely absent from the repertoire of funerary models. Most notably, these are the themes that involve the person of the tomb owner. The figure of the tomb owner dominates wall scenes, being depicted multiple times in the chapel, displayed at a grand scale, and with most activities organized around his figure. Although the quantity and repertoire of these scenes varies between tombs, the tomb owner consistently forms the central figure of the representations. The tomb owner is usually portrayed in one of two roles, as a passive figure overseeing the work of his estate, or as an active figure directly engaged in certain activities. In both types of scenes, he is clearly distinguished from the other figures represented through his appearance, his attire, posture and scale. As a passive figure, the tomb owner is typically positioned at one end of a series of registers which depict minor figures engaged in everyday life tasks. He faces towards them though is frequently separated by a vertical ma'a inscription that states he is viewing their work. In this scene from the tomb of Pepiank the Black Edmare, the tomb owner is viewing agricultural activities, fishing and fowling, and other marshland tasks, and you can see the vertical Ma'a inscription that separates him from them. As an active figure, the tomb owner is principally engaged in three main types of hunting activities, spearfishing, fowling with a throw stick, and hunting in the desert. In each of these activities, the tomb owner acts as the central protagonist. He is directly engaged in the hunt and is always successful in his endeavour. The hunting scenes commemorate the tomb owner as a person of high status and express his contribution to the triumph of order over chaos. <clears throat> Another scene in which the tomb owner assumes the central role is the offering table scene. In its characteristic form, it comprises the tomb owner seated at a table piled with offerings, but the theme is regularly expanded with additional motifs, such as priests performing ceremonies, offering bearers transporting goods, and an offering list, like you can see here in this scene from the tomb of Neonk Pepikem at Mare. Depicting the offering table scene in the tomb chapel conveyed the tomb owner as the primary recipient of the goods transported by the living and his desire for this provision to continue perpetually. <coughs> These themes that involve the tomb owner's active participation are completely excluded from the repertoire of funerary models. There are no known models of the tomb owner spearfishing or fowling. There are no models of the desert hunt. 
And while there are models of offering bearers, there are none of the tomb owner seated at the offering table. The tomb owner as a passive figure also rarely appears among funerary models. Instead, models concentrate on the productive tasks of minor figures. Now, it seems that one of the main reasons for this difference in representation is the contrasting locations of the two media in the tomb. Funerary models being housed in the burial chamber accompanied the body of the deceased. He could view the activities being performed, and so there was no need to represent him among the sculptures. It's notable that one of the most popular locations for funerary models in the burial chamber is next to the eye panel of the coffin allowing the tomb owner to directly view the activities. It's therefore not necessary to represent the tomb owner as a passive figure in funerary models, as he was physically present with the sculptures. A location in the burial chamber also meant that models didn't interact with the living, and so they did not have a role to play in attracting and impressing visitors to the tomb. Representations of the tomb owner as an active figure were therefore not essential among models either. So my comparative analysis revealed several distinguishing details between funerary models and wall scenes that had not previously been acknowledged in scholarship. Close examination of the repertoires of both media has shown that the themes represented by models were specifically selected according to the medium's role in the tomb, rather than simply duplicating the repertoire of wall scenes. The themes and motifs most commonly attested in the model corpus are those that provide the supplies and services of greatest benefit to the deceased's eternal well-being. Representations of food preparation and transport are particularly prevalent and can therefore be considered essential to the model repertoire. Themes that convey products and services considered desirable rather than essential appear infrequently and are usually confined to more expansive model assemblages themes such as animal husbandry and industrial processes. This condensed nature of funerary models also resulted in some themes being reduced to the most characteristic activities. In the agricultural cycle, for example, granaries are by far the most common stage represented by models as they formed the culmination of the entire process and enabled the final product to be readily available to the tomb owner. In this condensed form, the earlier stages of the agricultural cycle were less significant, with representations of the first activity of ploughing and sowing appearing very infrequently, and the interim stages of harvesting, threshing, winnowing and sieving being entirely absent. In addition to the different levels of importance of certain themes among funerary models, there is the noticeable absence of some of the essential themes among wall scenes most notably those involving the person of the tomb owner. This is a clear contrast between the two media and reveals that there is a difference in purpose and that a unique repertoire was selected specifically for funerary models. For the themes that are represented by both media, we also see differences in the minor details which can be attributed to the contrasting technical properties of wall scenes and funerary models. Artists could only work within the capabilities of their specific medium, and we can see that designs were created specifically according to those properties. This created some noticeable differences in design. My research has shown that funerary models shouldn't be understood as duplicates or substitutes of wall scenes, as scholarship had previously presumed. Funerary models had their own distinctive repertoire and their own unique designs, which were created according to their specific purpose in the tomb and their unique technical properties. Being located in the burial chamber, funerary models were exclusively accessible to the deceased and couldn't be seen by the living. This close association with the body presents a direct connection between the services offered by models and the tomb owner's afterlife. The emphasis on provision that is seen in the repertoire of models can be considered essential for the medium to fulfill its specific function in the tomb successfully. Funerary models should therefore be understood 
as a distinct type of representation that was specifically conceived to provision the deceased for eternity. Thank you. Question in a, oh, I need, do I need to speak into the mic? Um, it's better if we're, that mic won't pick up everyone. Okay. We have, we have uh, time for questions. Um, uh, I'll repeat your question for the recording um, and take it away. Any questions? Ellen? Yes. So you actually went to Egypt and saw some of these. Okay. And that was the requirement of your thesis, of your degree. The, the question is, did Dr. Barker see these in situ, the wall uh, paintings? Yes, the, the scenes, because they're painted and carved on the walls of the tomb, are, are still there. Um, they have been recorded, but they are presently being, the, the scenes in Mayor and Beni Hassan are presently being re-recorded by the Australian Centre for Egyptology, which is based at Macquarie University. Um, so I was able to go with my home team um, to the sites and see the scenes in person, which is wonderful because a lot of the scenes in the tombs that are less well preserved were not as well documented back in the kind of late 1800s, early 1900s when they were first documented. So there were additional details um, and scenes that had not been recorded. I was able to examine um, as well, which was really wonderful. Um, the models are today housed in museums all over the world. So they are greatly dispersed. So I was able to visit a few of the key institutions that had that house quite a few of the models. Um, the museum in Cairo in particular has a large collection of these models, so I was able to go and view them in person. Um, but a lot of them I also was, was only able to view online. That's what I was going to ask you. Where did you see all these models? And they were mostly in Egypt in a museum? Or? Yeah, the models are... I don't know about percentage-wise. I'd probably say about half of the ones I looked at are in are in Egypt still, um, but the others are all over the place. There's a lot in the U.S., a lot across Europe. Um, there's often you'll often if you're now attuned to models, if you go into an Egyptology collection, you'll often find one, usually a boat. Um, I know there's a few in California, um, so keep an eye out for them. You'll you'll spot them. Any photographs? You took of the, models, the photographs that I showed in this presentation were photographs from the museums that they have taken professionally and I've um, obtained permission to use. Great. Yeah, beautiful photographs, yeah. Uh, and any other questions? How tall are these? The question is how uh, tall are the models? The models do vary in size, um, also vary in artistic quality depending upon the resources that the tomb owner had available, um, the quality of the artist. Um, the one you can see on the front there is probably roughly 40, 50 centimetres long and probably about 20 to 30 centimetres high. Um, that's pretty average. They can be, they can be quite large, um, but there is quite a, a diverse range of sizes. Yeah. I have a question about, oh, I'm sorry, sir, are you in the back? I noticed that um, some of the tomb owners' names ended in Cam, and some of them were listed as the Black versus just some of them as Cam. Is there a rhyme or reason to the names? Yeah, the names are listed as the Black versus just some of them as Cam. Is there a rhyme or reason to that inconsistency? The question is why did, why was this one guy, um, uh, said, what was his, um, Pepeonk the Black, and other people just kind of have names? Well, yeah, the difference in names is, is mostly about how we record them, the Egyptians. Um, had sometimes had more than one name um, and it depends on how we record them. I've chosen to follow the processes used by the present team, the Australian Centre for Egyptology, who are re-recording these tombs. Um, but Pepeyank the Black can also be said in the full Egyptian, using the Egyptian transliteration. It's just I've chosen to use the Black to kind of make that a clearer distinction. Um, it's just a personal preference, yeah. Um, my question has to do with the boats. Now, your your spreadsheet has something like 144 models of boats in, in the corpus that you studied uh, yeah. versus 12 only on the wall. What was, do you think, the purpose of the boats and how could it be better expressed as a model rather than as a two-dimensional two depiction? 
Yeah, absolutely. Boats are by far the most common theme. Um, it took a lot of work to analyze all of them. It's a huge quantity of examples um, and it's the one you'll find most common. Um, often tombs will have two boats um, and they're usually actually oriented north and south. So one rowing and one sailing to actually indicate the direction of travel. And I think boats are particularly common in funerary models because it the boat was the main form of transport in Egypt and it's very much closely associated with all forms of movement and particularly in, in travel to the afterlife. And so this connection of being able to give the tomb owner the ability to continue to travel, gaining access to the afterlife and continuing to travel in the afterlife, I think is really crucial. And I think that's why we have it as com more commonly represented. Um, we do have boats in wall scenes. Um, sometimes they're in related to a funerary context, so representing the funerary procession. Other times it's more in an everyday life context with rowing and sailing, um, which is, I think, just less significant because it's not, that was less about the portrayal of the status of the owner and more kind of those everyday life tasks. Um, whereas in wall scenes, uh, sorry, in funerary models, it really gives the tomb owner that, that ability to continue to move um, for eternity. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Well, uh, okay, in the back, please. Is there the possibility that some of these uh, boat models are actually intended for um, kind of the ritual of the uh, voyage to Abydos, since that is definitely one of the two wall scenes that is quite frequent? The question is, can some of those boat models relate to the uh, voyage uh, to Abydos, which is uh, a common subject of wall scenes? Yeah, really great question. Um, I think in short answer, yes. I think the idea of this pilg pilgrimage uh, to Abydos of Osiris, um, related to Osiris um, for the, um, the god of the afterlife, I think that a lot of the boats are funerary in nature. They're kind of a papyriform vessel and have a lot of associations with the Wedjat eye being depicted, um, sometimes with priests depicted on board as well, sometimes the coffin depicted on board. And I think it is this representation of the tomb owner making that voyage and that, that journey um, as it's most likely that tomb owners were unable to actually, most tomb owners would have been able to do that in their lifetimes. And so it's this kind of understanding that it may have happened um, in the afterlife. And so I think absolutely that that is a really close connection with, with particularly the funerary boats. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, Glenn. Um, quick question. What was the economic and, I don't know, royal status of the tomb owners that you looked at? Okay, good. Um, probably the recorder can pick up Glenn, but um, what is the status uh, socioeconomically of these people, these tomb owners? Yeah, so for wall scenes, wall scenes are really only in the tomb chapel primarily. There are some examples in the burial chamber. So they were only in tombs of the highest officials who could afford to have a superstructure. So we really only see them in the tombs of, of the very highest elite, the governors of the province and the other highest levels of the administration. Funerary models we see in a much di more diverse range of burials. We do have evidence of funerary models in those, in those tombs of the highest elite. Unfortunately, most of their burials have been plundered and so we don't know as much as we, we could have known about how, much, how, how often they had funerary models among other goods. Um, but funerary models also then send down throughout the rest of the population. Um, and they're very common in the tombs of the lower cemetery, which is where the kind of lower administrative elite and the family members were buried. They're very common amongst that level. Um, and it seems like some might have been available a little lower down, um, but most of the general population we don't have as much evidence for. Um, but then we also see variation in the quality and the quantity, which is partly dependent upon the, the resources available to the tumor owner.